Hello everybody and a very happy World Book Day. I'm David Williams and this is Ernie and I thought what better way to celebrate than to answer your questions, read from some of my books including an extra special sneak peek from my new book Robodog. I know it smells nice doesn't it? And if you stick around to the end you will hear all about how to enter an exclusive competition. Now I love World Book Day. We didn't actually have it when I was a child in the early 1900s but what I love about it is that it's all about reading for pleasure and finding the books that you enjoy and really want to read. Now when I was a child I was lucky enough my mum and dad took me and my sister to the local library every couple of weeks and we picked a few books and I'd often pick books about space, about dinosaurs. Um, it wasn't until I found a book by Roald Dahl called Charlie and the Chocolate Factory that I really fell in love with reading for pleasure. So I think it's all about finding a book that you love, that you really want to read. And if you like scary stories, read scary stories. If you like funny stories, read funny stories. But there's nothing better than reading for pleasure and also sharing that reading for pleasure with others. So if you, I know it's boring, if you love a certain book, recommend it to your friends because they might not have heard of it. Now we can't talk about World Book Day without mentioning the costumes. Now one of my favourite, and it's really quite surreal for me actually about being a children's author, is that every year I see how many of you dress up as my characters. Um, it's a real thrill when I get to see all the pictures. And Gangster Granny seems to be a particular favourite, it doesn't matter if you're a boy or a girl, I see so many Gangster Grannies. And um, because Gangster Granny seems such a favourite, I thought I would read a bit today and I'm going to read out loud in case you thought a bit boring just to watch you read a book. So I'm going to have to ask you to lay down for a little bit. Is that okay? Yes, okay. And he needs to get comfortable and you get comfortable too as I read a scene from Gangster Granny. Now if you know the book you'll know that this boy Ben discovers that his granny is actually a gangster granny and he discovers that by finding a biscuit tin full of jewels in her kitchen. Now this is the part in the story where granny has laid out all these jewels on the living room floor and she's explaining how she stole each one when they notice that someone is spying on them through the window. Ben's eyes darted towards the window. For a brief moment he saw a dark figure peer through the dirty glass and then quickly disappear out of view. There was a man peering in at the window, said Ben breathlessly. Oh no, said Granny, I told you not to look. Shall I go out and see who it was, said Ben, trying to hide the fact that he was more than a little frightened. Really, he wanted Granny to go out and see who it was. Oh, I bet it was my nosy neighbour, Mr Parker. He's a retired major and now he runs the local neighbourhood watch scheme. What's neighbourhood watch? Oh, it's a group of local people who keep an eye out for burglars. But Mr Parker just uses it as an excuse to spy on everyone, the nosy old git. Is he suspicious about you? said Ben, more than a little panicked. Are we suspicious about everyone? We have to keep an eye out for him, young lad. The man is a menace. Ben went over to the window and peered out. He couldn't see anyone. Bring! Ben's heart let him to beat. It was only the doorbell. But if they let Mr Parker inside, he would see all the evidence the police would need to send Ben and his granny straight to prison. Don't answer it, said Ben, as he ran to the middle of the room and started stuffing all the jewels back in the tin as quickly as he could. What do you mean, don't answer it? He knows I'm at home. He just saw us through the window. You answer the door and I will hide the jewels. Me? Yes, you! Hurry! Bring! This ring was more insistent. Mr Parker had left his finger on the buzzer for even longer. Ben took a deep breath and walked calmly through the hall to the front door. He opened it. Y -y -y yes, he said in a squeaky high voice. C -c 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 Can I help you? Mr Parker put his foot inside the bungalow so the front door couldn't be closed on him. Who are you? He barked nasally. He had a very big nose. 
which made him seem even nosier than he was, and he already seemed extremely nosy. Because he had a big nose, he also had a very nasal voice, which made everything he said, however serious, seem a little bit absurd. But his eyes shone red like a demon. I'm, 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 I'm Granny's friend, spluttered Ben. Why did I say that, he thought. In truth, he was in a terrible panic, and his tongue was running away with him. Friend, snarled Mr. Parker, pushing open the front door. He was stronger than Ben and soon forced his way inside. Why are you lying to me? He said, taking several paces forward as Ben took several paces back. It was as if they were dancing the tango. I'm not lying, cried Ben. They reached the living room door. You can't go in there, yelled Ben, thinking of the jewels still scattered all over the carpet. Why not? Um... Um, um, because Granny is doing her naked yoga. Sadly, the nosy neighbour was not convinced. Naked yoga, a likely story. I need to talk to your grandmother right away. Now get out of my way, you nasty little worm of a boy, he said, as he shoved the boy aside and opened the living room door. Granny must have heard Ben through the door, because when Mr. Parker burst into the room, she was standing in her bra and knickers in tree pose. Mr. Parker, do you mind? said Granny, in mock horror that he had seen her in a state of undress. So that's a bit of Gangster Granny for you, and I think it's time to hear from you. So let's hear the very first question. Hello sir, this is Anushka and I would like to ask you about what inspired you to become a writer and what were the challenges that you faced when you became one. Thank you. Anushka, thank you for that question. I love your earrings. So why did I become a writer? Well, I think it's about having a story to tell, something you want to communicate with others. And for me, I had an idea about a boy who goes to school, dresses as a girl, and I wanted to see how his family would react, how his friends would react, how his teachers would react. And that book became The Boy in the Dress. And I thought, well, it's a story about being different and celebrating difference. And I think we all feel different in some way or another. So I thought maybe it was a story that kids would want to read. And that really set me on my path to becoming a children's author. And I think the challenge really early on when you're starting to write stories, is really, I think, knowing where you're going with it. So I plan out my stories. I have an idea of where they're heading. I make notes and things like that. Because otherwise, I think you are often stuck. You don't know when you're finished and don't know where you're heading, and that's when you get lost. Lots of people say to me, oh, I don't know how to finish my story. So I think if you've got an idea that you can write down that, that might be the end of your book. You might have a better idea as you write the book, but just have an idea of the shape of the story and then I think it will become easier. So shall we have another question? Hi David, my question for you is, if you could be any character from your books for one day, who will it be? Caleb, I love that question. So if I could be any character from one of my books, well, for the day. Well, I, I'd like to be longer than that. I'd like it to be my, my lifetime, and I think I'd be Billionaire Boy. And there's one simple reason for that, Caleb, which is Billionaire Boy has a water slide going from his bedroom down into a swimming pool below. Now, I love water parks, I love water slides, and um, that would be, for me, a dream come true. I just need to write some more books, and then I might be able to have my own water slide. But that's a great question, Caleb. Let's now have another question. Hey David Williams, how do you get so many good ideas for all your books? For all of these books, how do you get so many good ideas to write them? Hello, Shavi. I mean, I loved seeing that amazing pile of books you had of mine. So it's, uh, it's lovely that you like my books so much. And how do I get so many good ideas? Well, I'm not sure they're all good. But um, I get my ideas really, I think, from looking and listening all around me all the time because you never know when a good idea might pop up. You might be watching something 
on the TV or you might overhear a conversation on a bus or maybe your granny or granddad, if you're lucky enough to have them, might tell you a story. It might just start the ball rolling um, for a story of your own. When I was young, um, I used to think my granny was a bit boring. She wanted to play Scrabble and we ate cabbage soup and all that kind of stuff. And then one day, when I was a kid, I asked her all about um, the Second World War because maybe I was studying it in school and it was interesting. And she had all these incredible stories about her adventures, about sleeping in the underground system. So, you know, um, she would be safe during the night. And, and so I'd say to you, if you're thinking about writing your stories, is, you know, certainly ask family members for their stories because they might have really, really fascinating ones, fascinating things that happened to all of us. And um, even when something like maybe a plumber comes to my house, I'll say, oh, what's the funniest thing that happened, you know, on, on your adventures as a plumber? And, and, you know, no doubt they'll have some interesting story that, I don't know, I'll store in the back of my brain and might use one day. Okay, let's have another question. What inspired you to make real events into fiction books like Space Boy and Codename Bananas? Thomas, it looks like it was just your ninth birthday, so from the balloon in the background. So if it is, happy birthday, Thomas. Um, so what inspired me to use like real life events in my stories? Well, I think it often gives quite a good setting. Space Boy is set in the 1960s during the space race when uh, Russia and America were competing to be the first, you know, first man in space, the first landing on the moon, that kind of thing. And Codename Bananas is set around World War II, which also I felt was a great setting because there's all kinds of adventures that happen during wartime that wouldn't happen at any other time. And I, th I think when you're creating a story set in a certain era, you should try and be as true as possible to that time, but at the same time, let your imagination run right. I think, for me, a film that I loved as a kid, because it came out when I was about nine or ten, was Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is set just before the Second World War, um, as a sort of, you know, basis in historic truth, but none of the events in Raiders of the Lost Ark actually happened. So it's quite a good um, model in a way, which is just thinking, oh, okay, I can use that as a backdrop, but I don't need to necessarily tell a real story. Um, so I think that leads us rather nicely on to Space Boy, and I'd like to read a little bit of this to you. Now, Space Boy is all about this girl, Ruth, who um, finds that an alien craft has crash-landed on the farm she lives, and this is America in the 1960s, but I'm not going to do American accents because I'm not very good at accents. But um, this is a bit from Space Boy, and it's from Chapter 6, which is called A Kaleidoscope of Shadows. With Yuri, her little dog, perched on her shoulders, Ruth shimmied down the wonky drainpipe on the side of the farmhouse. Peering through the slim gap in the curtains, Ruth spied her Aunt Dorothy standing dead still in her bedroom with her ear trumpet to her ear, pointing up to the attic room. She looked like a crocodile lurking under the water, ready to snap. Ruth carried on down the drainpipe. On reaching the ground, her and her dog raced past the chicken coop, the pigsty and the ostrich pen. They tiptoed round the sleeping cow and bull before crossing the golden field of wheat to the crash site. The spot was pinned by a plume of black smoke. The smoke was so thick that it blotted out many of the stars in the night sky. Ruth's heart was beating fast. Her head was spinning. Her legs felt like jelly. Any moment now, she might be the first person on earth to meet an alien. Soon the first pieces of debris from the flying saucer came into view. Smouldering shards of metal had flattened and blackened the golden wheat. The debris from the flying saucer was spread over a wide area. It had been a monster crash. The flying saucer had hit the earth hard and fast. It had gouged out the ground and was now half buried in the soil. There were clumps of little fires burning all around it. Ruth clambered up onto what was left of the flying saucer. Soon she had made it up to the glass pod 
that squatted on top of the spacecraft. The flickers of flames, the smoke and the dark of the night, together created a kaleidoscope of shadows. Suddenly, Ruth felt a stab of fear. She was relieved to feel her little dog brushing right up against her leg. Yuri always made her feel safe. The glass of the pod was cracked and blackened with soot from the fire. Slowly, she reached out her hand to touch the pod. Yuri was clearly spooked by the thought of Ruth touching the thing, as she could feel her little friend tugging on her pyjama trousers to stop her. Despite the danger, she placed her hand on the glass. Ouch! she exclaimed. It was blazing hot, like the handle of a saucepan on the stove. Well, the flying saucer must have burned through the Earth's atmosphere. Ruth knew from reading about the first man in space, Yuri Gagarin's journey, that re-entering the Earth's atmosphere was the most dangerous part. Ruff! barked Yuri at Ruth, as if to say, I told you so. All right, all right. Not everyone is as smart as you. Next, Ruth yanked the sleeve of her pyjamas down and wiped the soot off the glass with it. Soon, there was a small, clear patch in the black. Ruth peered into the pod to see if there was any sign of life. There was none. Just as Ruth was about to turn away, a gloved hand thumped on the glass. Doof! Ah! she screamed. So that was Space Boy, and I think it's time for another question. Hello, I'm Bethan from Swaddling Coat, and I've read all your books. I really like writing too. Do you have any tips, please? Bethan, what a fantastic question. I'm really glad you like my books. I'm really glad you love writing too. So you're already doing something that turns you into a writer, which is reading as much as possible, because... I liken it to, you know, wanting to play the piano or the guitar or something and you've never heard music. It seems impossible, doesn't it? So I think part of becoming a writer is definitely reading as much as you possibly can. So looking in the library for all kinds of books maybe that um, you wouldn't normally read and getting inspired by them. Really, when you're writing a story, especially a story for children, the only limits are your imagination. You can go anywhere. You can go all across the universe. You can go back in time. You can go forward in time. You can do absolutely anything you want. So try and dream big when you're dreaming up your stories. And I think we're having one last question, so no pressure, but I hope it's a good one. Hi, David. What's your next book going to be called? Hello, Frankie. Well, I'm glad you asked, actually. Um, so this is my brand new book and this is the very first copy and it's called Robo Dog. It's all set really around a police dog school and all these police dogs keep getting things wrong so this special Robo Dog is invented to fight crime um, but it ruffles quite a few feathers in the police dog training school. Um, I'm going to read a bit to you and this is right at the start of the book, so hopefully it will set the scene for you. Bedlam was a pustule on the face of the world. A jungle of crumbling buildings loomed over narrow streets, casting them in eternal shadow. Rats ran riot. Trash was piled up on street corners. The river was a deep shade of brown. And a thick smog hung over the city like a bad smell. Bedlam had once been home to the dreams of ordinary people. Now it was a place of nightmares. The city jail was overrun with the most wicked criminals, but Bedlam made new ones all the time. The latest evil duo to make the front page of the Bedlam Bugle was Mighty Mind and his henchperson Hammerhands. The headlines of the Bedlam Bugle read, Evil duo steals priceless painting, and mighty mind strikes in the dead of night. Bedlam may have been a lawless place, but it was not without hope. The shortest person in the police force was also the most able. When she was a child, she would arrest the bullies in the playground. As soon as she left school, she joined the police force, 
and since then had been on the front line in the fight against crime. The lady was older now and had finally been made Bedlam's chief of police. She was known simply as chief, even to her wife, who was an inventor she called Professor. One of the chief's big ideas was to open Bedlam's first police dog training school. She was sure dogs could be a powerful weapon to prevent the city's criminals from taking over. To begin with, she had been proved right. Her army of police dogs, paired up with police officers, had brought some of Bedlam's supervillains to justice. Thanks to those brave dogs, these supervillains were now locked up in Bedlam City Jail. However, every week, more and more supervillains emerged, and sometimes it felt as if the police were losing the battle. The chief found a deserted army training camp on the outskirts of the city, and had turned it into a school for police dogs. At the far end of the training field squatted a little broken-down shed. It was a pathetic sight, with a flag permanently at half-mast. The flag had the Lost Patrol emblazoned on it. The Lost Patrol was the nickname for a trio of dogs who lived in the shed. They were called that because they'd been at the training school for years and years, but had never passed. These dogs had to do their training again and again because they were either too nervy, too lazy, or too silly. Scarpa might have been a huge, powerful German shepherd, but he was the nervy one. The poor thing was frightened of a flea. Plank was the silly one. And when I say silly, I mean super silly. She was so silly, she would forget she was a dog. Gristle was the littlest one, and also the idlest. Gristle would sleep all day if you let him. All three members of the Lost Patrol were responsible for some of the world's worst dog disasters. There was the time Scarpa was hiding under a chair and accidentally tickled the bottom of the chief of police with his tail. Or the time Gristle stole a police motorcycle so he wouldn't have to take part in the cross-country run. Or who can forget the time Plank thought the visiting president was a robber and wrestled him to the ground in front of the entire school. The terrible trio had now been living at the police dog school for longer than any of them could remember, especially Plank. Plank could barely remember her own name. However, the chief had high hopes that this year the three might just scrape through and finally be out there patrolling the streets of Bedlam, fighting crime catching the baddies, being awarded big shiny medals for their bravery. How wrong she would be. So that is RoboDog, and you are the first kids in the world to hear anything from this book. So I'm really glad I got to share it with you today. And um, that's about all we have time for. But before I go, I wanted to share the details of a very exciting competition for 10 schools to win my full library of books and I will even sign every one of them for you too. Now, all you need to do is head to my website, The World of David Williams, and tell us which character of mine is your favorite. And this has been so much fun today. Thank you for your great questions. I wish I had time to answer them all. And I also wanna say a massive thank you to everyone watching at home, readers, parents, caregivers, and teachers. Your continued support means so much to me, and I hope to see you all soon. So, from me and a sleeping Ernie, we want to say goodbye.